In Vessel of Hatred, we travel south to Nahantu, a region with both deep ancient jungles and vast sprawling plains. It's the last stretch of land in Sanctuary's eastern continent, and we've packed it full of experiences for every type of player. In this expansion, there's a whole lot to explore under the dark canopy of Nahantu. Nahantu is the southernmost region of the eastern continent that Diablo IV has been taking place in. It's the last region that we haven't visited yet so far in the game, but it is one that we've been to before in Diablo. There's lots of new areas. We have six in total. Four of them are jungle-themed, and then we have two that are Red Rock Canyon, but each one of them has their own unique identity. When you first arrive in Nahantu, you're in this place called Lingering Hatred. This is a high treetops canopies where you're almost walking amongst the branches high above the jungle floor. Imagine a thick canopy that the light is just barely poking through. The whole area has been infected by this thing called the Hollows infestation. The Hollows are a new enemy that's associated with Mephisto. They themselves are kind of like a tar-like substance creature born straight out of the depths of hell. It feels a little twisted. There's a sickness to the area itself. Humans have ventured into this deep part of the jungle where there's all this poisonous plants and, and flora. The dregs actually started experimenting with eating these hallucinogens, and it put them into this aggressive psycho rage. The dregs were pretty fun because we were able to push more variety in the monster family. You have one of these tall dregs and then half of a body of another dreg on top of it, kind of controlling it and telling it where to go and tossing poisonous bombs at the player. When you come across it, it's very memorable. And then we've also got the area of Tenganse, where you've got the Tenganse Plateau, which is full of these red rocked plateaus and canyons. Imagine getting up above the land. Those gigantic walls have pockets inside where monsters could live. It offered up a lot of opportunity to bring back a monster family like the Lacunae. We're bringing them back in a new way here as a fully fleshed out monster family with multiple classes. What a more brute force looks like, what a caster looks like. They are very much apex predators, and we're definitely in their territory. And then there's a little sub-area called the Skittering Earth. The name alone makes your skin crawl. And it's bug infested, and you can see how the bugs have destroyed the jungles and kind of input their influence on it. Within the Field of Giants, you have these giant corpses of these long-dead demons that humans have begun to mine away at for their resources. While they've got a lot of use out of them, they're also toxic to the land around it. The notion of massive demons walking sanctuary a thousand years ago is really thought-provoking. Plateau's also got just this beautiful color scheme to the lighting. It's really lovely to be there. And then horrific at the same time, you know, it's great. The mercenaries in Vessel of Hatred are a group of people who we like to describe as ordinary people with extraordinary skills. They have the same level of will to fight against the demons of hell. And there's four mercs that you can collect over the course of the campaign. It starts with Rahir, a blacksmith and a shield bearer, is a more defensive fighter. He's able to go in there and soak up damage, use his shield as a bulwark against the enemy. You meet him early on in the campaign, and he's one who introduces you to the mercenary network. You end up finding acquisition quests for three other mercs that you can find throughout the course of the story. Subo, the drunken archer, is going to work really well for people who want someone who's out of the main melee in the back, offering utility and that kind of range support. Then we have Variana, a Berserker Crone, who's a melee combat fighter, close range. She's got a really cool combat meter, a, a massacre meter, where you need to keep killing enemies to get the meter to be filled. She's got a bunch of really interesting utility skills that you can kind of build in. Finally, we have the demon child, Aldkin, who's a magic user who can transform himself from human form to demon form and join you in combat. There's this really great reinforcement ability where you can take one of the mercenary skills and attach it to one of your powers so that when you use that skill, it calls them in to do a specific skill. With the mercenaries for Vessel of Hatred, one of the things we are expanding on is the skill tree. For Diablo 3, you had a very basic type of mercenary, but this time you can actually push a little bit more into the skill tree and make the mercenary the way you would want to play. Going through each mercenary progression arc and outfitting their skill tree so that it's complementary to your character build, I think that's where the fun in the mercenary system really lies. 
The Dark Citadel is a new in-game feature that's coming in Vessel of Hatred. It's an entirely cooperative player experience. All the mechanics within it are based around you working together with your party members to solve the challenges and face the first Khazra hordes within. One of the outcomes of the Mage Wars is this giant crater and all the souls that were kind of lost in it from those wars. The goal of the first Khazra, who are kind of the original Khazra, they're using the powers within the citadel found within this crater to perform experiments to try and bring back their dark god. Only recently, people have started going missing. They head into the Khazra region, they disappear never to be seen again. So it's clear that whatever they're planning is about to come to fruition and your job as the players to get in there and stop it. Citadels are a place where we take what is the best part of Diablo, combat, and we test it in a different way, which is adding in cooperative mechanics that you have to manage on top of that. For example, a boss has an attack, and as a player, you have to collect an item that allows you to reflect the attack back at him. So there's a little bit of a twitch level mechanic there where you actually have to time your reaction shot. What's interesting about it is when you get multiple people in there, we're each responsible for reflecting that shot once, so we all have to sort of master the timing of that move. You can't do that kind of thing without coordinating as a team, and that's sort of the example of what Citadel gameplay feels like. When designing the Citadel, we designed a lot of really cool bosses. And so one of the things that we did is we took that design and made like armor sets for each of the classes. That way you feel like you took their armor and you feel like you're wearing a little bit of them after your victory. We also have a currency that's dedicated to the Citadel where as you play through, a vendor can be interacted with to buy custom cosmetics that are unique to the Citadel. You can play with two people, but the, the ideal experience is for four. But in order to facilitate that, we've built an all-new Party Finder feature. And the community has been pretty vocal about wanting this for a long time. It made a lot of sense to us to pair it with this new Citadel mode. It really is an activity that's geared towards people who love to play together with their friends or with strangers and enjoy that cooperative gameplay. I cannot wait for players to get into the world. I'm really just excited for people to see all the little hidden storytelling elements that the team has fit in. So there's interesting things to find and see and discover around every corner, and it's just a really great experience getting to explore Nahantu.